All right, welcome to week seven of our journey through the American political system. Uh, week seven, we're going to discuss the politics of public opinion and the media, and this actually starts module two. So welcome to module two. Politics involves dividing scarce resources fairly among competing interests while balancing liberties and all rights. Reasonable people may disagree about how and by whom these tasks should be accomplished. These are political opinions. S political scientists measure political differences by collecting and analyzing information on public opinion. Over the years, Democrats and Republicans have moved further apart in their beliefs about the role of government. In 1987, Republican and Democratic answers to 48 value questions differed by an average of only about 10%, but that difference has grown dramatically to over 18% in the last 25 years. And as you can see, um, this uh, slide shows you the widening of uh, political uh, differences and political values. So what is public opinion and what do I mean when I say public opinion? Well, public opinion is defined as a collection of popular views on something. Opinions are based on two things, attitudes and beliefs. A belief is a closely held idea that supports our values and expectations about life and politics. Attitudes are our preferences, which are formed by the experience that we have in our lives. At the heart of the discussion around opinions is the idea of socialization. Political socialization is the process of learning the norms and practices of a political system through others and uh, through societal institutions. There are certain agents of political socialization. Those are the institutions that teach us and influence our opinions. Those agents are family members, religious leaders, teachers, friends, work colleagues, and others. This is a depiction of how parental political orientation influences the political orientation of children. Notice there is a strong influence from parents. After all, family, and especially our parents, are the first to introduce us to politics. The attitudes and belief that help shape our opinions on political theory and policy form our political ideology. Political ideology is not static. Age, education, changed circumstance, or new experience may influence one's political ideology, but only events that significantly affect an individual tend to alter fundamental beliefs and attitudes. Here you see the spectrum of political ideology. That spectrum um, that you are seeing is color-coded. Blue means the more liberal, and uh, the red means the more conservative, or bl again, blue is Democrat, red is conservative, Republican, um, and there's the spectrum there. You see that the center has no, um, let me get my pointer. The center has no writing in it. However, the center is where we like to be um, and hope to be. Um, however, you tend to fall more liberal and conservative um, just depending on your ideology. Once attitudes and belief are ingrained in us, they are often hard to change. This makes political polarization extremely difficult to overcome. Take a moment to think about the current political atmosphere. Do you think our society is polarized? 
Polarization occurs when individuals' political ideologies and opinions are more likely to be strictly defined by the political party with which they align. Public opinion on a given issue may differ dramatically depending on the political ideology or party of those who are polled. Take a look at figure 6.7. Notice how political ideology affects respondents' answers. Democrats are more likely to support increasing health care spending and spending on social support policies than Republicans are. Figure 6.7 is an example of different political opinion polls. Polling allows for citizens' voice to be heard ideally on different issues. Political scientists measure public opinion on political issues, political candidates, and their voting preferences through the process of polling. Polling involves asking a population a series of questions, collecting the responses as data, and analyzing and interpreting that data. Believe it or not, there is a scientific method to collecting data from the process of polling. Scientific polling applies a methodology. It, it creates a set structure to the polling that will guarantee valid polling results. To create a valid poll, one must do certain things that are outlined on this slide. They are identify a topic, identify the survey population and sample, or the who are we going to poll, Prepare and validate questions to ask the respondents. Contact respondents in the sample. Complete the number of usable responses needed for the sample. Analyze the data. Report the data. Informal polls that do not apply rigorous methodology are called straw polls. Okay, so let's talk about sampling. And I will give you a disclaimer. I am not a researcher. Uh, I have had research classes and done well in those research classes, but research is not my first love. However, it is important for us to understand the research process and how it applies to political polling in order to determine different outcomes. And this, this process is how we measure and how political scientists measure um, political opinion. So researchers identify a desired group of respondents they want to interview. From that population, they determine a sample. There are two different types of samples a researcher can decide to use. The first one is a random sample, and it is limited. It is a limited number of people selected in such a way that each has an equal chance of being chosen, which basically means you have eight apples for your sample. Those eight apples have an equal chance of being chosen they are randomly selected. You're, you don't have any type of uh, bias in selecting the best looking apples or the ripest apples. You don't take any of that into account. In a random sample, you look, take those eight apples and each of those apples have an equal chance of being selected um, as the top four to sample. A representative sample is a group whose demographics distribution is similar to that of the overall population. Larger samples make a poll more accurate, but after a correct representative sample is obtained, any increases in accuracy are minor and not cost effective. Questions about demographics, education level, zip code, or affiliations may be asked early in the poll to help determine which respondent should be included in the representative sample. So a representative sample would look like 
you have eight apples, you're going to choose four apples to sample. So two of those apples have holes in them. Well, you're wanting to gather information about a sample uh, population of 138 apples and 98 of them have holes in them. So those four that have holes in them, you will randomly select two of those to include in your sample of four because they're representative of the overall population. Hope that makes sense. So we've talked a little bit about sampling. Um, now we're going to talk about what are known, what is known as margins of error. And the margin of error is a number that states how far the poll results may be from the actual opinion of the total population of citizens. So this is an important number whenever you're looking at polling data um, to keep in mind. The lower the margin of error, the more predictive the poll is. Polls that show results too close to call may be within the margin of error. For example, in an election poll with a margin of error of plus or minus 5%, either candidate A, who has 52% of the voter support, or candidate B, who has 48% of the support, could win the election. Even if the results show that voters slightly prefer candidate A, the 4% difference between the candidates is less than the total margin of error. So let's talk about some of the, pro some of the problems with polling. Polling problems make polls less accurate, and there are two common problems. First, there is timing. Events matter when we talk about polling. So if you are doing election time and um, you take a poll in August, but then a terrorist attack happens in September, the nature of that poll and the responses and support of a political candidate after that attack may increase or decrease based on the perception of the general public. The next problem is human nature. Um, there is a term that is coined the Bradley effect. And in essence, the Bradley effect states that voters who answer polls were afraid to admit that they, for example, would not vote for a black man because it would be seen as being politically incorrect or perceived as racist. So the Bradley effect basically states that voters may tell you one thing uh, or tell a, a pundit or polling um, person one thing, but actually do another because they were afraid of the perception of their true intention um, would have. Some additional polling problems include the lack of respondent knowledge. Um, they may be asked a, se a series of questions um, that they may not really have knowledge about. Uh, social pressures, sample errors, uh, wrong technology used to engage the population, manipulation, um, data analysis errors, high margins of error, um, and so on. Generally, there is diffuse support, the widespread, widespread belief that the country and its legal systems are legitimate for government. Presidential approvals typically begin high but without defining domestic or international events, trends downward over time. So for your presidential candidates, it is common to see that their approval ratings would start high and typically trend downward as their presidency goes. 
unless there is some type of uh, domestic or international event that would sway the public opinion. Congressional approval uh, ratings experience highs and lows. Um, Congress's biennial election cycle keeps it in the spotlight. So because you are constantly um, re running for election in Congress, uh, it keeps the, them in the spotlight. So Congress's approval ratings typically are a lot more unstable. The Supreme Court has the highest approval rating of any branch of government. Controversial opinions, however, especially on societal issues, affect the approval ratings. However, the Supreme Court typically has the highest approval rating out of any branch of government. So let's look at an example of this. Here you can see Obama's presidential ratings. Notice how they generally decline over time, but also fluctuate based on uh, specific events and perceptions of the opinions of those events. So you see that it was high, it goes low, and then kind of comes back up. Here is a congressional job approval rating for the past 40 years. Con congressional approval ratings over the past 40 years have generally fallen between 20 and 50%. However, these ratings spiked to over 80% in the wake of terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. So you see how um, unstable congressional job approval ratings typically are. Public opinion can change and be changed by the political climate. Favorability polls that measure the public's positive feelings about politicians can affect voter turnout. Uh, consistent media coverage of a candidate's performance called horse, the horse race coverage makes elections seem a lot closer than they are, changing voter behavior and encouraging conclusions unsupported by data. What the media can affect our... Um, our perceptions, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Increased media coverage of candidates with strong polling numbers can lead to what's known as the bandwagon effect, in which a candidate is presumed to be, to be the winner um, and everyone seems to be on their bandwagon, thus bandwagon effect. So what affects personal political opinions? So we have attitudes, beliefs, socialization, our identity, our life experiences, family and friends tend to be um, the most influential in our public opinions, in shaping our public opinions, education, resources, uh, political elites, media, uh, and so on, all shape our public opinion. Hopefully you have a basic understanding of how political ideology and public opinion is formed. You should also be familiar with how we measure public opinion. Now we will turn our attention to the conduit that it heavily influences and, and is heavily influential in shaping our public opinion and ideology, the media. Some news outlets style themselves as liberal or conservative presenting what's known as overt content or political information in which the author makes it clear is only one-sided. If, if they make it clear that it's one-sided, that is overt content. Others claim a lack of bias but present covert content 
or ideologically slanted information presented as unbiased information in order to influence public opinion. Freedom of the press and an independent media are important dimensions of a liberal society and a necessary part of a healthy democracy. After all, Thomas Jefferson did say, no government ought to be without censors, and where the press is free, no one ever will. The term media defines several different communication formats, from television to print. The collection of all forms of media that communicate information to the public is called mass media. This includes everything, television, print, radio, internet. We expect the media to cover important political and social events in a concise and neutral manner. However, does our media cover events in a non-biased manner? Think about that question. Does the media that you get your information from cover it in a non-biased manner? way. Is it an overt or a covert? All right. The work of the news media differs from public relations, which is communication designed to improve the image of companies, organizations, or candidates. Public relations is not a neutral information form. However, the media should be a neutral information source. So what are the functions of media? The media exists to fill a number of functions, whether the medium is a newspaper or radio broadcast or a television newscast, a corporation behind the scenes must bring in revenue to pay for production. The media is also known as watchdogs of society and public officials. We've all seen those investigative reporters on the five o'clock news that go into different agencies and highlight discrepancies. Some refer to the media as the fourth estate um, with the branches of government being the first three and the media equally participating as the fourth. This role helps maintain democracy and keeps the government accountable for its actions. The media also engages in agenda setting, which is the act of choosing which issues or topics deserve public attention. Before the internet, traditional media determined whether citizen photographs or video footage would become news. The media also promote the public good by offering a platform for public debate and improving citizen awareness. Network news informs the electorate about national issues, elections, and international news. So, where do people get their news from? Each form of media has its own complexities and is used um, by different demographics. Age greatly influences the choice of news media. Millennials, born early 1980s to early 2000s, and Generation X, which are the 60s to 80s, are more likely to get their news and information from social media, such as YouTube or Twitter. Baby boomers, who were born in the early 40s to the early 60s, are more likely to get their news from television. And as you can see here in, um, in, the, in the figure that I'm showing, uh, you see that split um, between baby boomers, Gen X, and millennials, and just the different ways that they get their media. Early news was presented to local populations through the print press. After the Revolutionary War, a 
change occurred and the nation moved to the party press era in which partisanship and political party loyalty dominated the choice of editorial content. Between 1830 and 1860, machines and manufacturing made the production of new newspapers faster and cheaper. Radio news made its appearance in the 1920s. The proliferation of radio brought communication to rural America. Politicians realized this medium offered a means of reaching the public in a personal way. World War II changed the radio news forever. The need and desire for frequent news updates about the war made newspapers with their once a day printing too slow. People wanted to know what was happening and they wanted to know it immediately. Franklin D. Roosevelt, or FDR, famously utilized the radio platform in what would become, what would become known as his quote-unquote fireside chats. These chats were regularly scheduled times where he would sit down and explain his ideas and philosophies with the American public. Television comp uh, combined the best attributes of radio and photos and changed media forever. The first official broadcast in the United States was President FDR's speech at the opening of the 1939 World's Fair in New York. Even more than radio, television allowed politicians to connect with voters in deeper ways. Before television, few voters were able to see a president or candidate speak or answer questions in an interview. Television was a true game changer in terms of politics. Now the public was able to visually see and read the person's body language. And we all know that body language is an important form of communication. This change became apparent in the Nixon and JFK 1960 presidential debate or the Richard Nixon, John F. Kennedy debate. Radio listeners thought it was a tie between the two, but those who watched it in television believed that Kennedy did better by his body language. Presidents often used television to reach citizens and gain support for policies and to inspire and comfort the, comfort the population during national emergencies. The introduction of cable and the expansion of the internet have inundated the public with information. Alternatives to watching new network news now exist and the public can even avoid politics altogether if they choose. Social media is a, is a recent phenomenon and it's credited as one of the primary factors in the successful election campaign of Barack Obama. So we see how social media and the internet um, has risen to become really influential forms of media in our political institutions. As we've discussed over the last several weeks, the media plays a vital role in our political institutions. While overall media can be utilized for positives, there are some ways in which the media um, has negative effects around our political ideology and institutions. There are two main types of um, news coverage bias that we're going to talk about. Those are framing and priming. So let's start with framing. Framing is the creation of a narrative or context for a news story. So there's a couple of types of framing that we're going to talk about. The first one is known as episodic framing. Episodic framing occurs when a story focuses on isolated details rather than looking broadly at the whole issue. Episodic framing um, was exemplified by um, Elian Gonzalez in the late 90s. Uh, we saw that um, a boy survived a um, rafting excursion from Cuba to Florida, and there was a fight over him between his family um, here in the States versus going back to Cuba to his father. Um, the news framed it as a, a battle and through episodic framing, we focused more on 
the battle between the family than looking at the whole issue of our immigrant of our broken immigration system. The next form of framing is called thematic framing. This takes a broad look at an issue and skips the numbers or details of the issue. And finally, the last part of framing is racial framing. And this occurs when a person or group is representative in a negative or assumptive light. Priming is when the media coverage predisposes the viewer or reader to a particular perspective on the subject or issue. The media is a regulated entity. So how does that regulation work and who oversees the regulation? Well, like any other political institution, the Constitution plays a role in this. Um, the First Amendment, remember the freedom of speech and of press, helps us to regulate the media. Supreme Court precedent also um, helps in regulating the media. And the Federal Communication Commission also helps us regulate the media. So let's take a look at the First Amendment again. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging uh, the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peacefully assemble and to petition the government for the redress of grievances. So as part of the First Amendment, when we discussed this, when we talked about our civil liberties chapter, um, is... The freedom of speech and the freedom of press, which expressly plays and factors into the media. While thinking back to our discussion around First Amendment protections, around the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press, back when we talked about civil liberties, um, there are situations in which the First Amendment does not apply um, to the freedom of press. Those situations are um, whenever there is slander or libel. The media does not have the right to commit slander, which is speaking false information with an intent to harm a person or entity, or libel, uh, printing false information with the intent to harm a person. There's also been restrictions around classified material. The media have, has only um, a limited right to publish material the government designates classified. Much like a lot of the precedent, um, it's, it, it's not as clear cut as yes or no um, as your book talks about um, throughout the chapter. The liberties enjoyed by newspapers are overseen by the U.S. court system, while television and radio broadcasters are monitored by both the courts and a government regulatory commission. The FCC, or the Federal Communications Commission, was established in 1934 by the Communications Act. The FCC enforces ownership limits to avoid monopolies and censors material deemed inappropriate. It has no jurisdiction over print media, mainly because print media um, is purchased and not broadcast. The FCC also maintains indecency regulations over television, radio, and other broadcasters, which limit content considered indecent and keep the public aware airwaves free from obscene materials. So remember when we talked about Miller versus California, um, the Supreme Court established what would be determined as the Miller test, stating that obscenity is something that appeals to deviance, breaks laws, and lacks values, and therefore can't air um, during quote-unquote normal times. But 
utilizing the Miller test in Miller v. California, um, the court did say indecency can air after 10 p.m. because less children would be watching television after 10. The equal time rule states that registered candidates running for office must be given equal opportunities for airtime and advertisements at non-cable television and radio stations beginning 45 days before a primary election and 60 days before a general election. If you um, think back to the recent um, runoffs that we had in Georgia, anytime you would hear a radio advertisement or on TV see a radio advertisement for Senator Raphael Warnock, you would also, that would immediately be followed by a radio or television ad for his um, opponent, Herschel Walker. So that's, think about that as the equal time rule. Here's a picture of the FCC. Um, the leadership of the FCC. All right, so let's talk about some transparency uh, issues. There are certain laws that regulate the media through requiring transparency. Um, when we're talking about transparency, we're talking about um, not hiding anything. So there are what are known as sunshine laws that require government documents and proceedings to be made public. There's also the Freedom of Information Act, uh, which is a federal statute that requires government agencies to provide certain types of information requested by citizens. Uh, the media can utilize these laws, uh, the sunshine laws and the FOIA, to gather information about government entities to then report on. That's, again, that watchdog function of the media. A final thought around media regulation has to do with the use of confidential sources in print media. While journalists can rely on confidential informants to gain insight into the highest level of bureaucracy, the courts have weighed in on just how confidential those identities can be. The practice of granting anonymity uh, to sources is something referred to as a reporter's privilege, which means that um, whenever we say anonymity, that means that the reporter states that they won't divulge the identity of the informant. Fueled by the First Amendment's protection of the press, Journalists have long offered to keep sources confidential and protect them from prosecution. However, in 1972, the Supreme Court determined that journalists are not exempt from subpoenas and that courts could force testimony of ne to name the confidential sources. Um, so the Supreme Court has determined that um, it is legal for um, a court to subpoena a journalist and make them disclose the identity of their informant. Those that refuse, refuse uh, to do so face potential jail time. In Brandsburg v. Hayes, 1972, three journalists were placed in contempt of court for refusing to divulge sources. The justices determined that freedom of the press did not extend to confidential informants. <clears throat> so that is an important concept. In Br Brandsburg v. Hayes, it was established that freedom of the press is not extended to confidential inf informants or confidential sor sources. Recently, the court, the current Supreme Court has refused to hear similar cases. Therefore, this remains the precedent and jurisprudence around confidential sources. All right, we've covered a lot um, this week. This week was a combined um, two chapter lecture. I've tried to keep it as short as possible as far as the lectures go. Please make sure that uh, you read the chapters. Um, 
I want to reiterate that this lecture is to supplement the chapter readings, therefore it's imperative that you actually do the readings. I cannot possibly cover all the material in this presentation, or this presentation would be like two hours, and I don't want to force you to sit down and watch a two-hour presentation. So let's go over some of the main points that we've touched on. Political ideology is derived from our attitudes and beliefs. Political scientists measure political differences by collecting and analyzing information on public opinion. They use what's known as the scientific process to do this. There are many agents of political socialization with family, particularly parents, being the leading agent. The media has three main functions, watchdog, agenda setting, and promote the public good. The evolution of media has seen several incarnations, including print, radio, television, and internet. And there are certain laws and regulations in place to help regulate the media as they can shape a person's political ideology through bias media exposure. All right. I hope you all have a great week that you learn a lot. And as always, if you need anything, feel free to reach out to me. Thanks.